We're reading responsibly. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and also the heights of the mountains. O come, let us worship and bow down. For the Lord is our God. Hear the voice of the Lord today. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. All right. Our scripture for today, then, is from Habakkuk. We are moving on in Habakkuk. And we are in verse in chapter 2, verses 2 through 20. And if you'll remember correctly, in the first uh, Habakkuk had a question for God. God answered the question, and Habakkuk asked him to explain it more. And so now we're listening to God's second answer to Habakkuk. He, he answers him again and gives him more information, and then tells the earth to be silent before him. And so listen to our scripture from Habakkuk 2, 2 through 20. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faithfulness. Moreover, wealth is treacherous. The arrogant do not endure. They open their throats wide as Sheol, like death they never have enough. They gather all nations for themselves and collect all peoples as their own. The woes of the wicked. Shall not everyone taunt such people and with mocking riddles say about them, Alas, for you who heap up what is not your own, how long will you load yourselves with goods taken in pledge? Will not your own creditors suddenly rise and those who make you tremble wake up? Then you will be plunder for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all who survive of the peoples shall plunder you, because of human bloodshed and violence to the earth, to cities and all who live in them. Alas for you who get evil gain from your house, setting your nest on high to be saved from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. The very stones will cry out from the wall, and the rafter will respond from the woodwork. Alas, for you who built a town by bloodshed and found a city on iniquity. It is not from uh, the Lord of hosts that people's labors only to feed the flames and nations weary themselves for nothing. But the earth will be filled with the glory, knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Alas, for you who make your neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath until they are drunk, in order to gaze on their nakedness. You will be sated with contempt instead of glory. Drink, you yourself, and stagger. The cup is the Lord's right hand, will come around to you, and the shame will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of the animals will terrify you. Because of human bloodshed and violence to the earth, to cities and all who live in them. What use is an idol once its maker has shaped it, a cast image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in what has been made, though the product is only an idol that cannot speak. Alas for you who say to the wood, wake up, to the silent stone, rouse yourself. Can it teach? See, it is gold and silver plated, and there is no breath in it at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Well, today we're beginning with the second answer to Habakkuk's many questions of God. And there are several principles within this that I want to share with you at work. Uh, God wants, uh, he wants to comfort his people. And, and in his second answer, God begins to instruct Habakkuk to clearly write down on a stone tablet what it is that he is about to reveal to him. He wants that the response that he gives to be available so that all are able to read it and all are able to, to have uh, what God is saying. God's forthcoming revelation is not just for Habakkuk, but it's for all God's people who will ultimately suffer at the hands of the Babylonians. Now, we're going to be studying this 
book, if Habakkuk hadn't written down what God had told him, what he was experiencing, uh, we wouldn't be able to observe what had happened in, that, in the time of Habakkuk. But God told him to write it down, and so he did. And this writing was to be permanent so that a generation upon generation upon generation would be able to hear what the Lord had revealed. It was also to be written plainly, written in, in a way that anybody could read it, and it was also to be made public so that anybody could look at it and, and read God's message. And Habakkuk was also to write it so that even if someone was running past with that tablet, that somebody would be able to read the message that God had for them. Now imagine a, a runner running past you and you being able to read the, the, the revelation of God there on that tablet. Habakkuk wasn't the only person in Judah that God wanted to, to hear this message or who needed this message. God knew that all of his people needed this message, and he knew that Habakkuk needed to share it with others out there in, in the public. Just as when God reveals things to us, we need to, to share with others out in the world. Now, God, he doesn't always act immediately, does he? God doesn't always act immediately. Another reason that God commands Habakkuk to record what he's telling him is that God, this thing that he's talking to him about, it is to take place in the future. It isn't going to take place immediately, but it will happen in the future. And so God doesn't always answer prayers right at the time that we want him to. Uh, in there, we hear, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. Uh, and just because God answers prayers, that doesn't mean that he's going to answer them snap of the finger immediately. Uh, the rescue that was going to take place would take some time. And so God wants us to know that we need to be able to wait patiently for that. God's word is true, and it's, it, it's about to come about. He, his word comes about. He declares this revelation that it, it, it hastens to the end. It will not lie. And so that promise and that plan of God, we know that it was going to take place. But it wasn't going to happen right there that very second. And so God wanted him to write it down so everyone knew what he had promised and that it would come about in, in its appointed time. Every, just like in Proverbs 35, it declares every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. We are to wait patiently on God. God says it seems, if it seems slow, wait for it. And that's not something we in our culture do very well. We don't wait very well. We live in a culture where everybody wants things immediately. They want things to go quickly. We have drive throughs we have microwaves. We want everything to happen immediately or as quickly as possible. And rarely does God function on our timetable. Even his timetable doesn't match ours. And so in our instantaneous culture, we sometimes get impatient with God as we are told to wait for his promises to come. God's will will come in his own time, and he will fulfill his word. It will surely come, it will not delay. But the timing of God rarely meets the timing that we have for well, God. It rarely meets our expectations. And even though God's answers are sometimes in the distant future, we can be confident that God will complete and fulfill those plans. Despite what we see as a delay, or despite what we might see to the contradictory, God always fulfills his promises. The revelation that God gave for the future time, and about future time, was one that he wanted everyone to know about. And while the immediate application for the people of Judah was for this immediate time that was to come after the Babylonian exile was over, the writer of the epistle of Hebrews, he interpreted it to return to the return of Jesus, to, to be about the uh, return of Jesus. Now, led by the Holy Spirit, he changed it to he, and he applied it to our Lord. This is what he wrote in Hebrews 10, 37. He said, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Along with the scoffers that Peter wrote about, some readers might ask, Wait, uh, uh, might ask, where, when is the promise coming? When is this promise coming? And we don't know that. But God's reply is, wait for it. Wait for it. I, it will surely come if you simply wait patiently. 
Now, a discouraged Jew in Babylon, he might have been asking at that time, will the Lord come and save us? And the answer was yes, but you might have to wait for it. As God's people, our life is to be characterized by faith. God declares, behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest, because he is as greedy as the grave, and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives of all the people. In these verses, uh, the true need of God's people is seen while they wait in faithfulness for God's promise to be fulfilled. The Babylonians and those in the world to varying degrees, uh, they, they were seen as puffed up and arrogant. They were greedy, they were discontent, and they were constantly in unrest and dissatisfied with what was going on in the world and constantly seeking more. And how many of us know people that are like that, who are constantly seeking more? Those in the world are, that, that are constantly seeking more are never at rest. And in contrast with that, the righteous are to live by faith. We are not to be running around like chickens with our heads cut off or a kid jumping into the hustle and bustle, always seeking more, but to live by faith, knowing that God will care for us. Those in Christ can rest, though all may fail around them, they know that God is there with them. And in, in contrast to the pride-filled Babylonians, God's righteous people are to live lives that are marked by that faith. Even in those dark times or times of crisis, faith is the confident outlook of trust and dependence on God and while living in faithfulness to the commands of God. And so God does not, he ensures Habakkuk that the evil that he's seeing in the nation of Babylon, that it will eventually be judged. That they will too receive their due punishment. And in the midst of his response, God gives Five woes upon the he, he responds with five woes against the nation of Babylon. Now, the first woe that God talks about is the, how the Chaldeans are plundering and, and stealing everything, how they're conquering all of these other nations. And, and all of those who were survivors of uh, uh, these defeated nations, they were faced to pay tribute and pledges to the people of Babylon, to their conquerors. And many couldn't afford to pay that tax. Some commenters point out that when nothing was left, how you paid the collector was by giving what you did own, and that was of yourself. You became a slave. And in this way, the Chaldeans, they gathered up lots of wealth and slaves, and the judgment would be that those that they plundered, those remaining people, that one day those people would rise up. They would rise up against the Babylonians, and they too would plunder them. Now, the second woe involves the, the Babylonians' greed and their unjust gains. In that verse, we see an image of a secure and unassailable house, yet one built by violence and bloodshed. And this woe is against the, those who would seek to feather their own nest by exploiting others and thinking that they uh, can get high enough that they can get away from being uh, having to deal with the problems or ruin uh, from others. And so David Baker, he says this, in his commentary, he says that the wording implies that these dynasties were built on their cruelty. And, and what God says about that is when you sin against people, that, uh, that you sin against yourself. You harm humanity. And you bring shame to humankind. Even the building materials of Babylon's magnificent city were going to cry out because of the harm that they had done, because of their sins. And eventually, it would all be brought down and they would all be brought to the same level. The third woe was the Babylonians did indeed build a great city, but it was again built on bloodshed and violence, and the judgment describes not, the, the, not only the leveling of the buildings, but also a fire that will come and destroy the city. All of that wealth they had gathered, all of those material beings that they sought more and more of, all those material things that, that they built this gigantic, wealthy city on, all of that would become the tinder that would light that fire and would burn the city. And uh, the commentator comments this. He said that the, the, the method of destruction that built Babylon was their warfare. They became rich by warfare. And my friend, if you stand back and you look at the history,
history of mankind, you conclude that he must be insane the way that he has lived on earth. And he is insane, insane with a sinful nature so that he can't even direct his path. He thinks he's right in what he does. And people have never waged war without thinking that they were doing the right thing. We see here God's con uh, condemnation of Babylon, but it can be stretched out and brought up to date and fitted like a glove on any of our modern nations as we choose. When we look at our nations, how many times have we as a nation gone to war with others and believing that we were doing right, but was it right in the eyes of God? Now the fourth woe um, that the Chaldeans were accused of encouraging others to drink until they were drunk so that they could take advantage of them. Now it was often true in war times that those who were plundering other nations would come along and they would subdue those that they were plundering by embarrassing them, by uh, brutally treat, treating them brutally and doing things to shame them so that they knew who was in power. And so they would, in this, they're, they're accused of getting people drunk and shaming them. And, and to shame them, they weren't, they weren't satisfied in increasing their own pride. They needed to make sure that everyone knew that they were better than them. And so the judgment, God would force them to drink of their own, uh, his cup of wrath. And, and they would see their own nakedness exposed. They would be exposed as those who were against God. And that some of the, their, uh, interpret the ver verse that says uh, that they would, their shame, the shame would come upon them to be that they would vomit up with, the, uh, vomit up great shame on their glory. Now they were drunk to the point of throwing up is what uh, some are saying. Now, which adds an interesting turn if you've ever read Daniel. Uh, when Daniel was captured and was taken to Babylon, Daniel and his friends refused to drink the wine of the king. And so that adds a, an interesting um, understanding to why Daniel may not have drunk from the king's wine. But also we need to stop and think that it, it was during one of those wonderful drinking parties of the Babylon, uh, the Babylonians, that the empire was brought down. It's recorded in Daniel 5. It was one of their great many drinking parties in which God came along and destroyed them. And so uh, we, we need to be careful who we try to shame. Now, the fifth woe for the Babylonians was their idolatry. Now, God clearly has commanded us not to make idols, that we were not to worship idols. God often mocked the idol worshipers, as he did with the Chaldeans here, and God points that the idol has no power, that it's powerless, it doesn't speak, uh, but that God is always the ruler of the whole earth, that God will always be the ruler of the whole earth. And even the prideful, violent, and haughty, destructive Babylonians will have to one day be silent and acknowledge God. In other words, God is saying to them, stop your idolatry, stop all this running to and fro, looking for the next thing to find pleasure or wealth or spiritual fulfillment, and stop all the hustle and bustle of life that separates you from God and be still and know that I am God. Now that was true for the Babylonians, but it's also true for us, that we too, when we get involved in the hustle and bustle of our world, when we don't take the time to, to keep our relationship with God in the right place, that we too become like the Babylonians. We too need to take time away and to be able to get away from the hustle and bustle of life that is separating us from spending time with God and to just sit and be still and know that he is our God. Habakkuk can rest assured knowing that God in his timing and his, in his ways works everything according to his purpose for the people of Judah. Now, the fall of the ba of Babylon the Great is a reminder to all of us that, that what man builds without God will never last. If what we are building, we are building on the backs of others, then it is not going to last. It will never last. The exploiter will eventually lose everything, and our utopias, of man-made utopias, they will turn out to be disasters. And so we cannot exploit people made in God's image and expect to escape God's judgment. When we build on the backs of others, God will indeed judge us. It may take time, but eventually that judgment will fall, and God will accomplish his ultimate purpose 
in this world to display his glory throughout the earth. Now, it, when we look out, outside into the great earth, we see many, many examples of God's great glory. In the end, God will declare, for the earth will be, be filled with the knowledge of God, uh, the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. That's God's highest purpose. It is to display his glory in this world. Now, God will achieve his purposes, and Babylon will lose all that it, it has gained, because Babylon was seeking to build an entire empire uh, for itself, rather than one that would serve God. We need to be careful that we, too, are building our, our world upon God and not upon our own desires, wants, and needs. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? People of this world, there are those who clamor and they strive for wealth and for security and for power and pleasure. They trust in idols of their own making rather than in trusting in God for their provision. But God says the labor is only fuel for the fire. They exhaust themselves for nothing. The Lord is in his holy temple, so let all the earth be silent before him. Habakkuk's imperious summons to be silent in the presence of the one true God is an apt conclusion to the questioning that the prophet has been having of God and the agonizing of the people over what's happening to them and the chattering of the pagans before their very idols. It also marks an appropriate response from us as people as we hear the Lord's pronunciation of judgment against Babylon. There is nothing more to say, nothing more that can be said. In the light of God's words of judgment against Babylon, it is right that every mouth be stopped. Amen. All right. So your questions. Have you ever seen people get a taste of their own medicine or to fall into their own traps? And how did that make you feel? Did you ever take it as a warning for yourself? And what sins of this nation are deplorable to you and which woes might Habakkuk or God pronounce on our culture today? Just some things to think about. All right, so joys and concerns. What do we need to be celebrating before God? What do we need to be praying for? What are our joys and concerns? Great. Thankful for some rain. Yeah. Cooler temperatures for sure. Yes. People of Puerto Rico. Yes, absolutely. A good turnout for today's event.
great and gracious Holy One, you are beyond our imaginations, beyond our control, and sometimes even beyond our comfort. You will not be bound by our schemes or ideas, and even so, we maintain appearances and jockey with our neighbors even as we make idols because of our fears. But your ways are not our ways, O Lord. You are not a God of tidy balance sheets or weekly appointments. Your love is too deep. Your claim upon us too pervasive. You are there when tempters fray and anger erupts. You are there when anxiety overwhelms us and we withdraw. You are here in every bruised heart, in every calloused hand, in every tangled dream, in every lost lost person. So move among us now, O oh Lord. Receive our broken spirits as the offerings that we bring to you this day. Because, merciful God, we ask you to breathe deeply into this room. Breathe into us your reconciling love and your holy expectation. Allow us now to see the faces of those we have harmed and those we have kept at a distance. And work in us, Lord, until our hearts are softened and we dare to seek our neighbor's good and to love others as you have loved us. Teach us to pray with our hands and our feet and our voices. We lift up to you now all that seems irreconcilable in our families, in our nations, in your church, and in your world. Today, Lord, we pray for those we identify as leaders in every sphere of life. We pray for our president, our governor, for all those who are leading companies, for all those who are leading nations outside of this one, for all those whose decisions weigh heavily on others. And even us, Lord, Give us courage to name ourselves as those who have responsibility for others in our lives and that resp whose responsibility to those who are other in our lives whom we lead, that it is great. Teach us to tend to our world. Tend to the world you love and to sow more than we reap, to heal more than we wound, to make room for others as you have made room for us. We pray with hearts that are both eager and reluctant, trusting that you'll meet us and call to us just where we are, just how we are. Today, Almighty God, in your presence, we faithfully bring before you loved ones in need of your healing and comfort, situations that need your intercession, as we pray especially, Lord, for the people of Puerto Rico. Lord, we pray that you would be with all those who are devastated by this hurricane, who are, are, have lost so much because of this disaster, and who may continue to lose even more. We ask that you be with each and every one of them, and all those who are coming to bring relief, and to bring resources, and to bring healing to Puerto Rico. We pray for the concert and the, the supper that we are, that Max is doing this evening, Lord. And we ask that you would bless all those who come to that event. That you would continue to be with them and bless them and move among us as the music moves among us. We pray for this earth, O oh Lord. We pray for our particular part of this earth where it is dry and drought has come. And we ask that you would bring rain to bring abundance to the land and cooler temperatures for those of us who live on it. Lord, we ask you to come and to be with us. And we pray with hearts both eager and reluctant, trusting that you will meet our needs. We ask you, Lord, to remind us, too, how we stand in need of your healing love and your healing touch. So fill us with your encouraging and renewing spirit and heal our wounds. Oh God, you are our God of salvation and you bring your compassion to all of us 
who are gathered here this morning. Help us to be restored and renewed, encouraged and enlivened as we turn our faces towards you. Lord, today we bring all of our prayers, all that we are and all that we will ever be to you. Use us, use our hands, our feet, our voices to speak your message into the world. Be with all those who continue to pray to you and who need you in this moment. We pray all these things in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray as one family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We stand in glory contrary to the <coughs>
wherever we are. And since without you we can do no good thing, may your spirit make us wise, may your spirit guide us, may your spirit renew us, may your spirit strengthen us so that we will be strong in faith, discerning in proclamation, courageous in witness, persistent in good deeds. This we ask through Jesus Christ the Lord and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing Shalom to you. <laughs> 